Okay, today I have with me Dr. Jose Antonio. Hi, Jose. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. I'm in South Florida. I know you're freezing your butt off in Norway. <laughs> so I won't tell you how warm it is, uh, although for me it's a little cold, but I'm doing great and I'm looking forward to this fun little interview here. Great, great. And your definition of cold is like the summer here in Norway, just to tell you that. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's true. I, I, I am a wimp when it comes to cold. <laughs> okay, first off, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview on your recent high-protein diet studies. Uh, before we start, could you give us a brief introduction about yourself, your background, and how you got involved in this industry? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, well, first of all, I got my uh, doctorate, my PhD, at the University of Texas uh, Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And since that was in 1993, since 1993, I've actually worked both in the academic side and the industry side of the sports nutrition, and I'll call it business. Um, currently, I am a faculty at Nova Southeastern University in Davie, Florida. That's in South Florida. And I'm also the CEO of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. And if you don't mind, I want to mention real quick, I'm sure a lot of you in Norway would love to come to Florida. Uh, June 9th to 11th is our third. 13th annual conference. It's in Clearwater Beach, Florida. It's on the beach. The beach. You guys will love it. So I'll see if you can make time for that. But, um, you know, I've been doing research in sports nutrition now for about two, three decades. And uh, I know you want to talk about some of the protein work I've done. And, uh, and the genesis of it is actually, you know, quite interesting. But suffice it to say that sports nutrition is my passion. And, uh, and when I'm not doing sports nutrition research, as you know, I spend all my time on the ocean or on the water paddling around. So, hey, that's what we get to do in South Florida. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, so, so first question. You, you mentioned you recently conducted several uh, studies on really high-protein diets. Could you uh, explain the background for conducting these studies and what did you actually find in the different studies? Yeah, in fact, um, let me sort of, I'll, I'll tell it as a story first, because I think it's easier to follow it that way, because anybody could pull up the papers online and read them, but you, know, you don't want to do that. It'll bore the hell out of you. So the, the genesis of it is really like this. When I, when I was an undergraduate student, I remember my, my nutrition professor saying, hey, for those, all those bodybuilders, we eat high-protein diets. It's bad for your kidneys. And I kept hearing that literally for years and years and years. Really, for 20 years, I've heard that. So I'm sitting around at the university talking to one of my students. This was like mm, two, three years ago. And he was a pretty large guy. And just out of the blue, I said, how much do you eat? Because I was curious. I'm like, this guy's got to eat a lot. And he said, oh, I eat three, 4,000 calories, and I get X number of grams of protein. And, and I started to calculate it in my head. And I'm thinking, huh, you actually eat quite a bit of protein. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, here's a guy. He's healthy, pretty well-built, muscular guy. Uh, what would happen if we just get a bunch of people who normally just work out and we give them a lot of protein? That was the initial study where we gave 4.4 grams per kilo of protein per day for eight weeks. And really, it was a simple, simple goal. What happens with body composition if we get people who work out and the only thing we're changing is they're eating more protein? And here's the interesting, interesting thing with that first study we actually found nothing, literally no change, uh, no change in, no significant change in body weight, fat-free mass, fat mass, percent fat, which in and of itself is kind of fascinating because people are like, whoa, whoa wait a minute, You're, they're eating all this protein but not gaining weight, which I'd have to say this is the first study I've done where I found nothing happened and people are really kind of upset about it. They're like, whoa, 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 that can't happen. And I, you know, my, my response is, hey, it is what it is. We measure it. You know, the data is the data. You know, why it's happening, I don't know. Maybe it's the thermic effect of protein. Maybe it's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Maybe it's something else. Who knows? So the second part, after that first study came out, someone said, well, what if you change the way they train? So in that study, we got a group of subjects, and we actually gave them a specific training program. And in this case, it was a periodized uh, sort of traditional split routine bodybuilding type program. So we, we gave them a program and we split them up into high protein and what I would call normal or habitual protein. So, and this is what's interesting. I don't know, I don't know, 
about the athletes you work with, but almost everybody that I've worked with already eats what some people call a high protein diet, somewhere around 1.9 to 2.0 grams per kilo. That's their baseline. So this is what we're working with. I don't know anyone who eats 1.0 to 1.5 grams per kilo at all. I mean, my own kids eat more than that. So, so they, we compared a higher protein diet, about three, a little over three to 3.5 grams per kilo to their baseline. And this is the one where we found that they actually lost fat mass, which is kind of interesting. Again, with them eating more calories. And so the question people ask is, what is it about eating more protein that might confer an effect with losing fat mass? And I think that's where people are like sort of scratching their heads and like, wow, what's really going on? Is, is protein really that much different than carbs or fat? So, so that's really sort of the big picture as to why we're doing these kinds of studies. Perfect. And you also had one recent study that was published Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The third part, in fact, um, one of the criticisms of the first two studies was that some subjects were well trained, other subjects were sort of trained, but they were, there was so much variability that, like, okay, what would happen if we got highly trained guys, just guys who love to lift, recreational bodybuilders, high end athletes? So we decided to embark on a one year study. And anyone who's ever done a study knows that, first of all, it's hard to get people to do anything for four weeks or a week, much less come in time and time again for one year. So what I ended up doing was publishing the first uh, 16 weeks of that study of the one-year study. And what we found, again, I need to explain to the audience that this is a crossover trial so that each person can be compared to themselves. And that's really powerful because you're not comparing yourself to a different group. You're comparing yourself to yourself. And we found, even though there was no statistical significance, because the sample size is fairly low, because not many people volunteer for one-year studies, yeah. but we found this, that of the 11 subjects that we were able to get data on, at least for the first 16 weeks, nine of them lost fat mass, 10 of them gained fat mass, which is interesting, but the general trend is that most people seem to lose fat mass when protein intake goes up. Now, I guarantee you, if we did a donut overfeeding study, they would all get fatter. I mean, because everyone knows if you eat more donuts, you get fat. So what is it about eating, and, and, the, and the form of protein is primarily protein powder, so what is it about eating extra protein in the form of protein powder that might confer a benefit with regards to improving body composition? That's really the question. Now, I will say this, mechanistically, I mean, those are, not, those are not the kinds of questions we look for in our lab. I'm looking primarily for outcomes, like what happens if you do X, Y, Z, what happens? Do you get A, B, C? Do you get D, E, F? So we're following these guys, and I think April, May is the one-year period where we're going to have one year of data on these guys, and they're highly trained guys. And I would guess, based on what I've seen, that one, and this is very important, we are finding no side effects, as in zero side effects in terms of renal function, liver function. In fact, I, I was texting with one of our subjects, and he, <laughs> you'll get this, on his normal or low-protein days, he consumes 400 grams a day. That's his normal. When he's on the high-protein phase, he's well over 600 grams a day. I looked at his blood work, and it is spotless. Nothing, I mean, his GFR, glomerular filtration rate, is fine. Everything is fine. Liver's fine. And, it's, and it sort of begs the question, it's like, it, 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 or it tells you how adaptable the human body is to whatever you do to it. And, of course, these guys, they work out like crazy. They otherwise eat well. They don't really eat junk food. None of these guys are junk food eaters. They actually eat quite well, so... Is there something different about protein that helps you improve body composition that goes beyond simple thermogenesis? You know, NEAT or, <coughs> excuse me, non-exercise activity thermogenesis or TEF, th the thermic effect of feeding. Um, I mean, I don't know, but the studies are fun and I love, you know, the data is kind of cool. Excellent. And just to, just to mention it. These studies that you've done on the high protein diet, they are really, really high protein. So what's normal, what's, what definition do they have for high protein diets normally in the literature? 
Ah, you know what? That is a great question. In fact, if you look at the literature, most scientists will define high protein really in a bizarre fashion. One definition I've seen is if it's more than the RDA, a recommended di a de daily allowance, which is 0 0.8 grams per kilo. I don't know what it is in Norway, but it's 0 0.8 here in the U.S., and that is low. Um, others have said high is anything more than 1.2 grams per kilo. Um, others have said if it exceeds 35% of your total calories. Now, we will say this. Using percentages are very misleading because if you're only eating 1,000 calories a day, if 35% of your calories are protein, it's still not very high. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do, and I've done this in my papers, is I've operationally defined high as anything above 2.0 grams per kilo because, at least from my experience, nearly all of the subjects I test, their baseline is already about 1.9 to 2.0 grams per kilo. So to me, high is anything that exceeds that. But here's what's interesting. If you were to ask... 100 scientists, 100 clinicians, what high protein is, they would say, well, it's probably anything that exceeds 1.2 to 1.5. And you know what? I would have to just disagree. It's, you know, to me, you know, using such a low standard for protein, particularly for active exercising individuals, I think is a big, big mistake. Yeah. We actually have a bit higher protein uh, recommendations here in Norway. Uh, we recommend 1.1 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight for... Whoa! I yeah. love it! <laughs> yeah, but uh, actually um, elderly uh, are recommended to increase it to 1.2. And now we're talking about people that don't, don't exercise. Wow, so, yeah. that's actually... You know what? I would have to applaud you guys for that because at least that's a big step over the 0 0.8. 0 .8, that, yeah. yeah, and I think in Canada it might be 0 0.9 or something silly. It's, it's nutty. It's just yeah. nutty. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, it's really easy to reach those requirements anyway. So yeah, I think exactly. a lot of people are <clears throat> way above those requirements. Especially here in Norway, there's been a lot of focus. I know I don't know how it is, is in the states, but here in Norway, we had a couple of years now where it's a really big focus on higher proteins in 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 the diet. So a lot of manufacturers are increasing the protein uh, content of their foods. Is um is the fish intake really high in Norway? Is that a large source of protein? Um, actually, in Norway, uh, when we look at the data, what is the highest sources of protein? Is actually it's actually grains. We're mainly getting our protein really? from grains. Yeah, actually, grains. Yeah. Wow! Don't well, I would imagine Norway would have to import grains because you can't grow grains there, can you? It's kind of cold, right? Nah, no, nah, we can grow grains. Oh, you can? <laughs> yeah, 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 we can. It's not cold uh, all the year, you know? So, <laughs> okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll yeah, have yeah. To visit Norway when it's warm for like July 5 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, something similar to the temperatures in Florida. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. <clears throat> so, based on these results that you have found, um, what would you say are the benefits of overfeeding protein? Well, I think, um, but, and again, I, I will address this uh, primarily, well, only to those people who work out. Obviously, if you don't work out, it, it's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. But to me, one of the benefits of protein is, is if you remove the bodybuilding aspect, is that it'll just help you recover. Um, I think one of the things, one of the uh, questions that needs to be asked is this. Is there ever a benefit to underfeeding protein or not consuming protein? And the answer to that is, I don't think so. And in fact, um, you know, people argue about the, you know, consuming protein pre or post workout and whether or not this so called anabolic window exists. And to me, that's actually the wrong question. The correct question is, is there ever, is there ever an advantage to not eating protein after you work out? The answer to that is no. So always consume protein after you work out, it'll help you recover. And it's also, it's a source of calories, vitamins, minerals, if you're consuming it as meat or as fish or as chicken or even protein powders. Even protein powders, are a lot of them are fortified with vitamins. Um, so I think just getting the nu nutritive value of it is important. But also, I think people need to change the way they view the three macronutrients, carbs, fat, protein. I tell my own kids, because my kids are quite athletic, that the two most important things they need to... Do, need to take care of in terms of their diet are protein, fat, protein, fat, protein, fat. In fact, I don't even mention the word carbohydrate. The reason I don't 
is this. I've never heard anyone tell me, you know, I'm having a hard time hitting my carb goal. I'm like, who the hell is that? I mean, hitting your carb goal is like, you know, is like seeing if the sun is shining. Well, it, sh it shines here. I'm not sure about Seattle, Washington. But uh, it's so easy to hit your carbohydrate goal. It's much more difficult for athletes to hit their protein and fat goal. So I think protein should be the default macronutrient when you're providing a diet to someone who's athletic. So, so to reiterate, I think that extra protein helps you recover. If you're interested in bodybuilding, it certainly could help there, although there might be an upper limit to how much you need mm -hmm. in terms of bodybuilding. But on the flip side, it may help you lose body fat, which, you know, for a lot of athletes, that's important. Losing fat mass can help you, you know, become a better athlete. I mean, you know, even for me, you know, I do a lot of, I, I race down here, I do some stand-up paddling. If I lost five pounds of fat mass, it could only translate into a faster athlete. So uh, the question is, do I want to lose five pounds of fat mass? <laughs> Probably not. I don't feel like it. Um, but yeah, it could definitely help, you know, eating more protein. Okay, great. Just a follow-up question to that. So what would your general recommendations be, let's say, per gram of, um, per, uh, per gram of body weight? Well, I think uh, I always start out with a baseline. I think everyone's baseline should be two grams per kilo, not lower. It should always be at least two grams per kilo. For fat, about one gram per kilo. For carbohydrate, I'd say aim for roughly three grams per kilo. And that's as a baseline. Now, if you're a triathlete, I would say titrate everything higher. So eat more carbs, eat more fat, eat more protein. Mm -hmm. If you're dieting down, let's say your goal, and you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of this, but people who just want to, they just want to look pretty, you know, I'd say titrate down the carbs and up the protein. And, you know, but, you know, training for physique stuff, I've always thought is kind of weird. And I'll tell you why. I think it makes more sense to train for performance. And if you train for performance, typically body composition takes care of itself. But if all you do is train for body composition, i.e. I want abs or whatever, you'll never hit the goal because there's not really a goal. There's no concrete goal. It's not like you cross the finish line. You're like, wow, I did it. It's No, the goal always moves. So, you know, for, for women particularly who want to look good, it's like train for a sport. Don't train for just standing on stage in high heels and, you know, your underwear because that don't last long. You ain't going to look like that forever. So that's my two cents. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you already um, mentioned it, you already addressed some of the questions. Um, next question is, does overfeeding on protein have a negative effect on, um, on the kidneys? Uh, and, I love that question. And before, before you answer the question, if you just could explain why, this, um, why people think that high protein diets may contribute to a negative effect on the kidneys? <clears throat> yes. Um, the whole protein kidney issue, I think originally it, it came about from looking at patients who had uh, renal, renal dysfunction, maybe had kidney failure, and that typically they put them on a very low protein diet. Because anytime you eat protein, one of the byproducts of consuming protein is you produce nitrogenous waste in the form of urea, which your kidneys have to eliminate. Now, I think the leap of faith is made where people think, well, if you're a diseased patient, that it also applies to the normal, healthy athlete or active individual. And that's where clinicians have been wrong for the last 30 to 40 years. And in fact, I would almost pose the question this way. If you go back 40 years ago, even 50 years ago, physicians and scientists were quite, what's the word, they didn't think cardiovascular exercise was good for the heart because they felt it overworked the heart. Now, you and I laugh about that. We're like, wow, overworked the heart? No, it's good for the heart. It makes it work harder. The function of your kidneys is to eliminate waste. That's its job. So if you're eating more protein and you have to get rid of the urea, the job of the kidneys is to get rid of it. Does it cause any damage? Now, or, or any kind of dysfunction in terms of kidney, uh, 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 in terms of kidney function? I've looked at the data on some of these guys, and they've been t eating a high-protein diet for eight to nine months, and again, nothing changes. Nothing changes. These guys, in terms of the renal function, liver function, and you look at their blood lipids, they are, they are spotless. I mean, these guys, if you didn't know that they were exercising guys and eating a boatload of protein, you're like, wow, these guys are really healthy. 
So I don't know why that myth persists. I think in large part it's due to the fact that so many clinicians, they teach their students, and then their students start saying the same old stupid things, and it's like, oh, my God, this again. So when the one-year data comes out, which we'll show at ISSN uh, June 9th to 11th, It'll be interesting because people are like, wow, on one year on this, it's, and nothing's happening. So, you know, and I'm sure people will say, oh, well, it's only about 14 subjects. You need more. And I'm like, I challenge you or anyone to get 50 subjects and get them to do something with you in terms of a study for one year. Good luck. You'll have a better chance of, you know, wrestling a grizzly bear and winning. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, so to, to finish it up, um, what does this, uh, these results from your studies um, contribute to the current evidence that we have on protein? And in regards to high-protein diets, what questions do you feel needs to be further investigated? Okay, those are great questions. I think the primary contribution is, is this, in terms of new scientific information. We know that protein, it's very difficult to get fat or fatter or add fat mass by overfeeding on protein. It seems to be very difficult. In general, about 75% of subjects who overfeed on protein tend to lose fat mass. About 10% nothing happens, and then there's a minority of people who seem to gain fat mass. So again, when you're dealing with individual variability, you got to keep in mind that some, although most respond favorably, there will be those who do not respond favorably. But when you're looking at group averages, it seems to point into the direction of being better for you. In terms of safety, we know it's safe. I mean, or there's certainly no evidence that it causes any harm. I think that's, that's certainly shown in our study. So I, don't th I think if you were to sort of lay a bet, most athletes who's, who consume a higher protein diet will benefit from it. Now, in terms of follow-up questions, um, at least certainly the ones that I'm interested in, one, I'd like to look at protein sources to see if that matters, and that's why we're doing a, a study on casein protein. It's a uh, protein from milk to see if, see if the timing, morning versus evening, impacts uh, changes in body composition or changes in performance. And also, we're going to finish up that one-year follow-up study on protein itself just to see if there's any any uh, you know harmful side effects in terms of kidney function and liver function. But there's so many things I'd like to look at. I mean. I actually work with a few people who are vegetarian, and they always ask me, you know, what about hemp protein? What about pea protein? And there's so little data on, on non-animal sources of protein that that would be another avenue to go, to go and examine. You know, is there a difference between overfeeding on a plant source protein versus something like whey protein or casein? So, God, there's so many things. In fact, if there's anything you want to find out, let me know, and I'll get one of my students to do the project. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Really looking forward to the results from um, your um, studies that are, are coming out, especially the, the one-year study that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. So thank you so much. This was really awesome to have this interview with you on your protein studies. Uh, I know you've written a couple of textbooks that are excellent. A lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of colleagues of mine highly recommend them. And you also have some... Um, in-depth articles that you also write. Could you please just mention the, the books and where people can read the articles? Yes, in fact, um, well, if you want to see, uh, I'll first mention the journal for ISSN, the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Our website is jissn.com. Also, I actually have a blog called the ISSN Scoop. If you go to the issnscoop.com, you'll see different blog articles. I mean, I write on occasion, and it's, it's a nice little break from typical scientific writing because I can be kind of goofy, sarcastic, try to be funny and stuff like that. So that's the blog post that I have. As far as the books, um, the latest book I have is with uh, Dr. Abby Smith-Ryan. She's at the University of North Carolina. And um, that is the current book we have in terms of studying for the CISSN exam. Uh, we also have an older one that's just as good, The Essentials of Sports Nutrition and Supplements. Uh, it's still timely. Um, but it's still a great book. It has a lot of information. Now, I will say this. For people who, who may have a time crunch in, in terms of learning a lot of this, the ISSN publishes a lot of position papers on different things like creatine, caffeine, protein, um, beta alanine, which is a nice summary of the literature. So if you want to get a good summary, our position stands are excellent sources of information. And I do want to mention... Um, we're going to be in London, which is close to you guys in Norway. It's, it's, it's two hours. 
uh, April 16th and 17th. I'll be giving a seminar on, on protein on April 16th. And then, of course, I want to mention Clearwater Beach, Florida, June 9th to 11th. It is our 13th annual meeting. Perfect. Once again, thank you so much for your time and uh, have a nice day. Hey, thanks, Joe. I appreciate it.